wasted hate, housework! Get me out of here! There are plenty of games that put you on the receiving end of a haunting, but none that put you in control of one quite like Ghostmaster. Halloween is right around the corner, and this is one of the most Halloween games ever made. It celebrates a lot of horror properties and the fun side of all of them, even when it reaches for some grislier titles. Unfortunately, this is not one of those games aging gracefully on the technical side. It was already rough at launch, but some issues like compatibility have gotten even trickier. So now we've got to treat our shit up. For starters, this is a 4x3 game, which isn't a problem on its own, unless the game is displayed stretched out anyways. The menus and UI stuff getting stretched a bit is fine, but the game itself being stretched does suck. If it does play nice in 4x3, that's great, but still not ideal for a strategy game. You gotta keep tabs on a lot of ghosts, people, and rooms, and some maps can be gigantic, so more game on screen is ideal. Other problems you think technology would brute force away like performance drops are still around. And not little missing frames that you have to be trained in the gamer's Nexus Dojo to notice, I mean PowerPoint slideshows. Beyond that, it's just a buggy game. To the degree that some ghost powers are flat out broken and don't have any effect. There are plenty of reasons why it's like this. The engine went through a rewrite mid-development, they were out of time and money, so many ghosts and levels were cut, and some ghosts were just thrown into other levels. And the original release ended on a sudden cliffhanger. It's one of those games that got dangerously close to not existing. This is where the Complete Edition mod comes in, which is fantastic and still actively being worked on. The base version includes lots of fixes. In widescreen, the UI is still stretched, but the font is better. But most importantly, the game world itself is now rendered correctly. Broken powers, some crashing, and other egregious bugs are fixed, but many remain. Performance in the iffy maps is better than vanilla, but still has its hiccups. It's an ongoing process, and there is another update coming in a month or so that'll fix even more of this, but even as is, it's still a huge improvement over vanilla. It also has lots of optional additions like challenge modes, restored ghosts, and brand new ghosts. A lot of them were on disc but inaccessible, so those ones are just in your roster now. But by using old design documents, concept art, talking to developers, and other clues, they've begun to outright restore some characters from scratch. I only enabled them through my second run of the game, but they do fit right in. In short, even if you don't want new haunters, grab the complete edition. Now that you know the magic of the install wizard, let's start the game properly. <laughs> Ghostmaster takes place in the unassuming town of Gravenville. Great amenities, nice people, and roughly 4 billion ghosts beyond the Vale. With so many there, the local haunting committee has assigned you to be the Ghostmaster. You command the spirits during hauntings and help expedite the eviction process for the mortals. During off hours, you take a more traditional management role. All the undead can be trained and upgraded more at your home base, the Ghoul Room. So you get to experience feeling dead while working in management. And that about does it. There is a story, but it's a very light one. Which is fine, because this is a game about driving people to madness with bagpipes. <laughs> Visually, it's a simple and cartoony game, and that's all it had to be. The environments don't have much that are striking or unique about them, but it does serve as good grounding since your employees will shake things up. Most maps will be fairly static and bright unless you decide to cut the power to them. There are some levels that lean more into it being creepy, but not too far. Again, you're the one doing the haunting, so the game isn't remotely trying to scare you. You're basically the eldritch force that's attacking the world of The Sims. I will warte. All of the NPCs can actually have a lot of interactions with their environment, with plenty of animations for everything in between. And that's exactly what you want to nail for this. When you start disrupting a TV, characters stop dancing, one goes over to check what's happening. The game is structured in a way where you usually can't bring out your big scares early and have to build up to them. So the NPCs have plenty of mundane fish tank activities to do, until things begin happening that confuse them, and then terrify them. You can use powers or hints in their bio to learn about their specific fears, but just watching them can give you a lot of info. But you don't need to be a scare scientist to learn that people have an inherent fear of suddenly being on fire. So there's a lot of reactivity in the world and its people for what you do. And that's a good chunk of the entertainment value. It's like being a kid with a hose and an anthill, but instead you fill the anthill with courage the cowardly dog villains. You even have the option to look into character POVs just to have a better view of the chaos. Even sleeping characters who will dream of sheep until you assign them a sleep specialist. RLS is now the least of your worries. All the animation is the focus and the strong point. All of the bizarre and violent powers you have, and the world's reaction to them. The graphics weren't winning any awards even back then, but it's effective for what it's set out to do, even if it can be janky. The sound of the game is overall in a similar spot. The environments have a decent variety, but most of the focus is on the ghosts and their powers. Nothing too noteworthy there. Oh. 
What is amazing is the game's music and how it's paced out with everything else. It's playful all the way through and sounds like something they'd play during a comedy silent movie. The beginning of The Haunting just has a few stingers here and there, and then at the end, it's pure chaos. Treat them all! Jotia! It has fantastic energy to it and really brings the whole game together. It's one of those games that you just cannot imagine with a different soundtrack. Beyond Sims Gobbledygook, there's also a lot of voice acting from the ghosts themselves. You'll come across many that you can free during the missions, and they all have their stories to tell. Hello, sir, or madam, or, well, whatever you are. Can I interest you in our range of facial care products? I never meant to kill no one, but I guess I did, and I guess I deserve the chair because of it. Hey, dude, like, what do you call it when my three geekazoid friends hold a seance for me? Nerdromancy! Hey! I killed me, man! But if you could help us, maybe I could come work for you. Bet you don't see many tricksters with gams like these, huh? What the fuck? Is that even a ghost? Well, what a ghost master actually controls is a wider range than you might think, but there's something fishy happening with some of these characters. As for the gameplay, you've got a lot of options. The missions are all structured around the terror campaign you're running in Gravenville. You'll be given a few assignments, which you can choose the order of. From there you choose which GSG9 ghouls you want on your team, though the game can recommend which ones to use for you. From here you've got your supply of ectoplasm. It's a capped meter that you spend by summoning ghosts to the field and using more elaborate powers. If you're making everyone shit their pants, your plasm cap goes up. But if they start calming down, it starts decreasing. It doesn't go down very quickly, but plasm is still the easiest way to own zone yourself. Because during a mission you can redeploy and move ghosts around all you want, and it saves the powers they're using. So if you redeploy a ghost using powers above the cap, your power is overexerted and you have seconds until you suddenly die. That one was high enough to actually make it two seconds. Unless told otherwise, ghosts are constantly using the powers you told them to, so you need to be careful rotating them in and out. See, the NPCs have their fear and madness meters, but also the belief meter. That means you can initially use cheaper spirits to help build the groundwork. You make electronics freak out, change the weather, maybe have an object or two fly off the shelf. It's all about weakening the mortals by learning their fears, picking away at their sanity, and driving them apart. They're more likely to calm down if they group up, but if you planned well enough, you could also get in a good group scare. Then you keep building plasm for more options. You need to milk this acroid slime as much as you can because you are operating under several limits. Most of your team can't be placed wherever you want, they need to be attached to a specific fetter. Some spirits only vibe with objects attached to violence and murder, your gremlins only want to go in electronics, some ghosts only like mirrors, and elementals will only go in their matter of choice. And those especially get questionable, but they're still funny. Plus, some objects count as multiple fetter types. It turns out that if you're in the spirit world, a war memorial is like an all-you-can-eat buffet, making it a good staging ground for lighting any wannabe exorcists on fire. Beyond strategizing using fetters, powers themselves can also synergize. Like multiple ghosts affecting the weather can create a more violent storm, or one spirit causes a leak in a flood while another causes a power surge. Beyond being a great way to stack up fear and madness, this is also what you need to do to get a bigger roster. Missions can have multiple beings trapped in them, which require very specific actions to free. If you do, they join you for the mission, and then permanently are added to your roster. You do get some automatically as the campaign goes on, but there are a lot of freaks you can add to your collection. And they all have a lot of character and powers to find, so it does feel worth the effort. At least it does most of the time, since some can get very convoluted to unlock. Like, scare away every nurse until this man goes down to the morgue in the basement. This is a big map they ask you to do this in, but even if you do skip out on a few, there are plenty of others to find. Though I would have liked to follow up on some of their motivations. Anyways, the mission goal is usually to scare everyone away. Others shake things up by having you scare someone specific away, but you know what you're here for. How quickly you do this, how well you stack your Amityville wombo combos and more will determine your score. A better score gives you more gold plasm, which you can use at the ghoul room between missions. Beyond already running an undead army, each haunter has multiple powers to choose from, and you don't need to worry about losing something cool as there is redundancy in the roster so other ghosts can have similar powers. It's still good to have favorites, and there are benefits there too. With a new Wild Ghost, they'll use the power at the top of the band and everything below it, shifting at random when they're off cooldown. They can also be given orders, though they only have a single slot and not many commands to start with. 
However, when you bring them on more missions, they get more order slots and can use more complicated commands. Target a specific person. Only use this power. Only use a power if mortals are in the area. It's a cute looking game, but there can be a lot of strategic depth to it, especially as the campaign goes on. You lure mortals to where they need to be before striking with another. You find ways to create new fetters or shift the existing locations of them. Herd the unthinking masses into the spook matrix. Being a chaos demon is at the heart of Ghostmaster, but the stakes begin at crash the frat party or scare everyone in a nice house. When it escalates to attack the military base, you feel a shift in the game. Oh, that is heartbreaking. Only terrifying innocent children would get old after a while, so the game introduces opposition. The mortals have called in a gifted medium. Gifted medium is like saying driest fish. Anyhow, if she sniffs you out, she can outright banish your ghost from the level. But by learning her fears and scaring her away, you can get rid of her like anyone else. And then the family calls up royalty. Royalty free. Who have the mortals called? This ghost breaker will banish your ghosts if you do not act swiftly. The ghost breakers are your arch enemy, some kind of fusion between the original boys and the three stooges. Make no mistake, they're still dangerous and can team up to banish your troops. So unless you bench them in time or scare the breaker, they're gone. Again, they're still a threat that has agency, so you can mess with them like anyone else. It does mean assaulting their HQ is harder than attacking a regular house, but it's all the same. However, this is where the game starts to change by introducing wards. These are phasmophobic shields that stop you from directly summoning ghosts inside of their areas. You either have to find an indirect way to destroy them, or find a way to get a fetter inside the field and then have the ghosts attack from there. These aren't a bad idea on their own and do work in some missions, but issues do start compounding with them. One way to create a fetter is that some ghosts have a power to make an irresistible gift that an NPC will pick up. From there you could use other powers to lure them towards the wards, but sometimes they don't do anything. Stairs especially are your kryptonite for them bugging out. It rendered my gift horse powerless. People bugging out in place wasn't an issue before, but now when you're trying to get one to go to an exact spot, it's hell. It's already tricky poking the living towards the objective. And it usually works fine, but the objective-based ones have so many obstacles in the way that their pathfinding is easy to break. It works fine throughout most of the game, it just so happens the spots you need it to progress break down. Don't go back down the stairs, please god. The hospital is the most egregious for this, and it could feel like dumb luck sometimes. It's already a game that puts a lot of limits on you, but now it starts pushing into being annoying. The maps are getting larger with more elaborate objectives, and where you could once knock one out in a half hour or so, now it could be hours. It does lean into the strategy and puzzle side more, but doesn't feel that fun compared to earlier missions. It wasn't bad enough to where I wanted to drop the game, but if you picked it up to have fun scaring people in a fish tank, the right end's here. It's also that the breakers and wards become your main opposition. And again, a lot was cut out here. They wanted you to face down Native American shamans, highly trained Jewish exorcists, feds. Areas could be haunted by a lone ghost or even an enemy ghost master, and you'd fight back and forth to try and manipulate the mortals. There would be other kinds of investigators and scientists who would convince NPCs it was all rational and make their belief go down. They had a lot of plans to make the challenges more dynamic, entire cut systems like anger that would affect the NPCs. It's pretty incredible just how much was in some stage of production, but this is what the game managed to ship with. And things weren't perfect up until this point either. For one, you can't investigate a level before deploying your haunters. So it's not clear who to pick, but the recommended spirits will be the ones that you need to free trapped ones in the level. There's some trial and error there. The basic camera controls are easy enough, but you'll be interrupted by reactions of people fleeing, and it's easy to skip over a cutscene if one pops up suddenly. You can feel the lack of polish constantly, but when it's fun, it's really fun. As for the story, like I said before, it's barren. It's mainly about freeing an entity called the Darkling, who is so powerful and evil that he'll be a great help to the team. There's also a mad scientist who wants to use him for his own means, but not much more to it than that. What is interesting is how the story progresses kind of in the background. A lot of the NPCs are recurring characters who will show up for multiple missions. In a mysterious cabin, you'll run into Bruce Elm. He's had a big night there, and later at the hospital, you can see he's been committed. They are just tiny blurbs, but there are a lot of evolving character relationships and bits like that in the background. It was planned for ghosts to be the same way, like you might see someone in town with the health of a Morton Joe, and then next level, he might be a ghost you can rescue. Instead, they're much tinier stories, and lots of horror jokes. Bill Hudson in the hospital, Vasquez and Gorman were in an accident, and Burke has chest pain. Man, lots of aliens jokes this year. Anyways, the game originally ended on a cliffhanger where the Ghost Breakers bring an anti-ghost nuke into the city. The sequel would have dealt with this, but since that never happened, the final level became a free download. They brought the bomb to the ghoul room, and you have 30 minutes to disarm it and scare them all out. And they've brought their deadliest servant to bear. You must beware of a new threat! 
The ghost breakers have harness captured Astral, the Blue oh, Board, damn it. and Alara to create a stay cold ice cream man. To his credit, he is extremely deadly, unless you have a ghost that has fire. Magnificent work, Ghost Master. You have defeated- Honestly, the previous mission is way more of a pain. Infiltrating the wards is much less convoluted in this one. It's still not a level I ever replay, but it's a much better send-off than a to-be-continued. When they're all gone, the grand finale is all your ghosts get to go into the light. All of your ghosts. I guess making college kids shit their pants redeem them. This takes a while. It has a lot of problems, but Ghostmaster's still charming as hell. It is janky and clearly undercooked, but the idea behind the game is just so great. The Complete Edition team will keep adding features and polishing things up, but it's a real shame that this is the only game like this. Sure, it breaks down sometimes and a simple cutscene turns into something from a Bollywood soap opera, but there's still so much to like about strategically scaring people. It wasn't like they lacked ideas to add more to the formula either, they just couldn't carry them out. I did have a sliver of hope when Cabin in the Woods came out that maybe we'd get a proper successor, but there was no such luck to be had. If you can get it for cheap, it's definitely worth a shot. Parts of it are a mess, but you can't find a game that embodies the spirit of Halloween like this one does. Speaking of which, I still need to prepare for that. I'll see you when the hunt begins. What intentionally funny game broke me with laughter? I guess Limbo of the Lost counts? As a kid, there was a part in Armed and Dangerous that destroyed me too. Thoughts on candy corn. As a kid, I would only bite the yellow ends of them off like a little freak, but I don't eat it much nowadays. What is best in life? Conan, you know that answer already. Going to give the new Cyberpunk update a try. I did. I've always really enjoyed the story of that game, but it just felt awful to play and was horribly buggy. I only came back to try a bit and I ended up sinking hours into it. I also didn't expect the return of Alien Isolation, so that was great. Which would be scarier to explore in real life, Subnautica or the forest? This question is a lot harder than I thought it would be. Because I know what's in both those games. I guess I would still go with Subnautica because being in the ocean would make me wonder what else could just show up anyways. But the sequel to The Forest does also open a gigantic can of worms and now that game's a lot more existential and crazy last I looked. At the end of the day though, I've still got to go with Alien Ocean. So the real answer is Barrow Trauma. The cleansing flame, the burning prison. Thank you for your aid, Ghostmaster. I still don't get it. 